Thank you for joining me today. We're going to begin our study of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Love Never Fails. So far we've looked at 15 of the 16 attributes that Paul will mention here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And today this will be the final lesson uh, that we will study in 1 Corinthians 13. I appreciate you joining me for this study. I think 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 7, are some of, those, some of the most powerful uh, passages we have in the Bible. I think they are the solution to every relationship problem. It doesn't matter what kind of relationship you're talking about. I often think about these myself and read them myself when feel challenged. And I often recommend them to others when they come to me and talk to me about relational issues. And I think that's why the Holy Spirit put them here through the uh, pen of Paul. Because obviously in Corinth, they were having a lot of relational issues. And he's telling them this is the most excellent way, the way to help solve those problems. God loves us because he chooses to. Not because we're always lovely and not because we're always lovable. Uh, God's love is just uh, unfathomable. There's no limit to it whatsoever. While the love that we demonstrate oftentimes has limits and qualifications, some will mention in just a few moments. I think that's why we can see that Paul says, without this kind of love, he says, no matter how sacrificial we are, no matter how many gifts we possess, how great our knowledge, how great our faith, he said, we are nothing. This love is essential to our spiritual health, our spiritual well-being, and our spiritual maturity. In fact, the attributes we're talking about are attributes that describe God. And so when we have these attributes as part of our lives, that makes us more in the image of God. And of course, that's what our Father wants. Let's reflect just a few moments about a few things. Think about the relationships that you that you have across the board. When you're in your final days, when you're in your final days, what will you want? Uh, will will you want that college degree in the wallet frame to be close to you? Will you be asked to be taken out to put in your the front seat of your favorite car? Will you revel over your financial statement? Well, of course, we know all those things are nonsense. What will matter the most will be relationships. What will matter the most will be people, the people in our lives. So the question is, how can I strengthen those relationships. And as I look at myself, I must ask myself, am I living in the overflow? Am I living in the overflow of God's love? How well do I love the people that are in my life? Does the way I treat them reflect the way God has treated me? You know, it's not easy to love those who have been a headache and a heartache who've been abusive in some way, uh, who have rejected us, who have made us feel lonely. We're left to wonder, how can we ever love? We're left to wonder, how can we ever love the people who've caused us such pain? If that conventional wisdom tells us that a lack of love implies effort, and so we need to try harder, we need to dig deeper, we need to strain more. But could it be a lack of love implies something else? Could it be that we're trying to give what we don't have? Are we forgetting to receive first? You know, the woman in Capernaum that washed the feet of Jesus with her hair, with the tears of her eyes and dried his feet with her hair, she learned something and knew something more about the love 
of Christ than Simon knew. Simon's hard and dry and parts. He had already forgotten more Bible than this woman ever knew. But this woman knew God's love has no limits. Simon had forgotten that. God's love meets meets the message, the standard. God's love meets the standard of our final message. Love never fails. In fact, that word, that verb fail, is used elsewhere to describe the demise of a flower as it falls to the ground, withers, and decays. It carries the meaning of death and abolishment. And so what Paul's saying is God's love will never fall to the ground, wither, decay, or abandon, uh, or abandon us. Listen to some other versions than the New King James. Love will last forever. It never dies. Another, it never ends. Another, love is eternal. Another, love will never come to an end. Another, love never disappears. Again, love shall never pass away. Love survives everything. Love always remains. Another, God's love will never come to an end. And the New King James, from which we're reading, love never fails. Governments fail. Sadly, marriages fail. But God's love will last. Crowns are temporary. But God's love is eternal. Money will, will, money will run out, but God's love will never run out. How could God have a love like this? Sometimes we measure God by ourselves. But God is unlike us. His love is unlike, unlike ours. His love is immensely different from ours. Our love often depends on the receiver of the love, but not God. God's love, God's love, unlike ours, is not regulated by our appearance, by personality, uh, by the feelings that we have for another, and often those feelings fluctuate. No, we have no thermostatic impact on His love. The love of God is born from within Him, not from what He finds in us. His love is uncaused, and it is spontaneous. Does He love us because of our goodness, because of our kindness, because of our great faith? No. He loves us because He chooses to. John says it like this, This is love that we have loved God. This is love, not that we have loved God, but that He has loved us. Certainly that ought to comfort us. God's love doesn't hinge on ours. The abundance of His love does not increase. The abundance of our love does not increase His. The lack of our love does not diminish His. Our goodness does not enhance His love nor does our weakness dilute his love. Moses said to Israel, the Lord did not choose you and lavish his love on you because you were larger or greater than other nations. For you were the smallest of all nations. It was simply because the Lord loves you. Paul will say, I call nobodies and make them somebodies. I call the unloved and make them, belo them beloved. Jeremiah will say, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I've drawn you to myself. You know what that means? It means we have a deep aquifer of love from which to draw. And so the question is, are we drinking? Are we drinking deeply? Are we drinking daily? And don't forget, love is a fruit. Step into the orchard of God's work. And what is the first fruit we see? Love. Love. Love is a fruit of whom? Our hard work. Our hard work. Our deep faith, our rigorous resolve, no. Love is a fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit produces love. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Maybe we need, maybe we need a refresher course on how vines function. What's the role of the branch in bearing a fruit? Well, branches don't exert a lot of energy. We never heard hear gardeners treating branches for exhaustion. Branches don't attend clinics on 
stress management. They don't groan and grunt. I've got to get this out. I've got to get this out. I've got to get this out of it. This kills me. No, the branch doesn't do that. The branch has one job to receive nourishment from the vine. And he says, you have one job to receive nourishment from Jesus. The message translation of this says, I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me I and I with you, the relationship, intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant, separated. You can't produce a thing. His job is to bear fruit. Our job is to stay attached. And the more tightly we are attached to Jesus, the more purely his love can pass through us. And so what a love it is, patient, kind, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud. Love never fails. Linsky will say love is permanent. All else pass, shall pass away. Love serves more than earthly and temporal purposes. It serves eternal purposes as well. McKnight will say to all its other excellent properties, this of its eternal duration must be added. Behold then and approve the beauty of a, of a universal, benevolent, which hath nothing in view but to do good freely for the sake of God, and with confidence rely on a virtue which is not to be destroyed, or ever abated by opposition, disappointment, ingratitude, or evil treatment of any kind. But which, but which triumphs over all obstacles and temptation, whatever. Love never fails. But compared to spiritual gifts, love will endure. In chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians in verse 2, it says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, prophecy was the declaration of that which cannot be known by natural means, the speaking forth of the mind and the counsel of God. It was important to the early church. Look at chapter 4, 14 and verse 3. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. Love was greater than prophecy. Love is greater than speaking in tongues. Apparently the most coveted gift of all. In chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians verse 22, it says tongues were for unbelievers. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. The sign, the tongue was an indication of the proof. The message was from God. It was genuine. Its purpose was the spread of the gospel and to show it was from God. So it wasn't for them that believed. It was for those that, that did not believe. This love is greater than knowledge that shall pass away. Look back at chapter 13 and verse 2 again. He said, Do I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge? In chapter 12 and verse 8, he says, To another, the word of knowledge through the same spirit. This supernatural knowledge, essential in teaching and explaining and applying the revelation. Such knowledge, having served its purpose, was to be done away. But in contrast, love never fails, shall never cease to be or become obsolete. Spiritual gifts fulfill their purpose, but not love. Love never ends like a flower or actor hissed off stage. Love holds its place, is not affected by time. And while spiritual gifts become valueless, love holds its value, seek enduring value. We compare the eternal nature of love versus the temporary nature of spiritual gifts. In chapter 13 and verse 9, it says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. In other words, what was needed on the occasion was given on the occasion. Again, emphasizing, don't seek after that which shall be done away, but that which is eternal. In verse 10, he says the, temp the spiritual gifts are temporal. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And then he will say in verse 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, the idea of dimly or darkly is at times it was revealed in riddles. It's expressing the obscure form in which revelation appeared. But then he says face to face, now I know in part, and then I shall know just also as I am known. 
I shall be able to look into the mirror and see a clear reflection. I shall be able to see myself as God sees me. And so while there are spiritual gifts, the revelation is not complete. And we will not see a true reflection of ourselves. But the revelation is perfect. And we know that revelation, things revealed. Through all revelation, we shall see ourselves as God sees us. Then we look at the excellent nature of love and its permanence compared to faith. Faith unites man to God, so man will have life with God in eternity. In chapter 1 of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. Verse 9, receive the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Faith is not an end. Its purpose is to bear fruit. This faith functions with time, in time with eternal consequences. And then faith compared to hope. I mean, love compared to hope is eternal. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And look at verses 24 through 25. For we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. This hope always has an object. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 5. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Look at Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised before time began. Look at chapter 2 and verse 13. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And godly in this present age. Therefore, hope as related to faith. In time, that hope will become sight. Hope as faith related to this life and time in a peculiar way that love is not. Then love is a divine quality, therefore eternal. Paul will say, you covet gifts. Love prepares for more than gifts. Those gifts will end, but love continues. The very essence of God himself is love. Look at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Notice in John chapter 13 and verse 34, it's called a new commandment. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you love one another. And then in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verses 37 and 38, we see love abides. Yet in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. And then finally, go back to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Verse 15. As we've known and believed the love that God has for us, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love abides forever. It eternally abides. The end of faith and hope bring a man into perfect harmony with the will of God. But love prompts him to obey and hear him. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 1. He will say, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, especially what, especially that you may prophesy. Pursue love. The point is what you are, not which gifts you possess. Keep on pursuing love. Make it your aim. Make love your greatest quest. Seek love earnestly. He says, Follow after this love. This is the most excellent way. Work at cultivating these qualities of love. Practice them, remember them, especially in times of conflict. Love is the fulfilling of all required duties and obligations to God. Without love, we're nothing. 
let's read right and rethink about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 8 as we close. As I read this, and I insert my name, I want you to insert your name as you read with me. Christ in Ricky is patient. Christ in Ricky is kind. Christ in Ricky does not envy. Christ in Ricky does not boast. Christ in Ricky is not proud. Christ in Ricky is not prude, is not rude. Christ in Ricky is not self-seeking. Christ in Ricky is not easily angered. Christ in Ricky keeps no wrongs. Christ in Ricky does not delight in evil but rejoices with truth. Christ in Ricky always rejoices, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Christ in Ricky never fails. Will we ever love like that? Will we ever love perfectly? No. This side of heaven, only God will. But we will love better than we have. When kindness comes grudgingly, we'll remember his kindness to ask. His, well, when kindness comes grudgingly, we'll remember his kindness to us and ask him to make us more kind. When patience is scarce, we'll thank him for his and ask him to make us more patient. When it's hard to forgive, we won't list all the times we have been grief, given grief. Rather, we'll list all the times we've been given grace and pray to become more forgiving. We'll receive first so that we can give later. We'll drink deeply from heaven's endless love. And when we do, we'll discover love worth giving. Well, thanks for joining me. And thanks for being part of this study in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I sure hope it's been beneficial for you. It's been a help to me. God bless you. Stay safe. And Jody and I love you.